Well, I'm going to talk briefly today about the secrets, mysteries, and hidden things of God. It probably is kind of linked to <clears throat> this last week's homework assignment or uh, our little spiritual challenge. Um, but I think all of us really want to know, you know, the, the deeper things, the hidden things, the spirit or the, the mysteries and the secrets of God. And um, you know, who doesn't want to be the one receiving a secret from God or something that's hidden or a mystery? I mean, it's like, don't we all want that? You know, it's just, I think we all want that so much. And um, in the scripture, there's, there's no formula. There's no passage that you can turn to and say, that if you want, you know, these things, here's what you need to do. And, but there's little snippets throughout scripture that kind of say, you know, here's a man and here's what he did. And here's some things that are helpful towards this. And um, certainly it's revealed in scripture, you know, in the whole of scripture. Um, but to try to single out those things and say, how do you find those? <clears throat> you really have to kind of look in Scripture and uh, find the little tidbits that you can. And that's kind of what I did this week. I went through, because I'm fascinated by this. I mean, I want the deeper things. I want that intimacy with God. I want, you know, to know these kinds. Of, I want these revelations, you know. And um, so anyway, this is what the Lord put on my heart. One of the persons that God brought to my heart right away was Daniel. You know, this was a man, actually a youth, you know, when he was brought out of uh, Israel into Babylon, just a youth, you know. He was not yet a man. He was a, a boy, you know, maybe in his teens, something like that. He was of a, either a royal family or, you know, a family that was very well off in Israel. Uh, he was handsome. He was good looking. He was smart and educated and this is who Nebuchadnezzar wanted you know he wanted a he wanted these kind of men and uh, he, he brought them back and so he was a captive he wasn't you know he didn't say hey I'll sign up for this he was taken from his family if they were still alive we don't even know they may have been killed you know we have no idea what happened but he was taken as a slave as a prisoner and as a captive albeit he lived in the you know in in the realm of the palace he had the king's food he had the best of the best if you don't get to say, I think I'm going to go for a, a vacation today or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to, I don't want to live here, I'd rather live there, you're a prisoner. You know, it doesn't matter how good it is. Um, and that was his, his plight. And in the best case scenario, he was a prisoner and his family was somewhere else. He was separated from them. Um, but the chance exists that his family had been all killed, you know, or members of his family, we don't know. Nevertheless, Daniel came in and we all know, if we know anything about Daniel, he lived an extraordinary life. You know, he served in the realm of four kings, and in every single king that he served, he rose to the top every single time, and he heard from God over and over and over. God revealed things to him that he didn't reveal to anyone else, you know, anyone. Um, so he is a good person to look at. If we're trying to figure out how do we hear the secret things of God, he's some person that we can look at and say, what did he do? You know, what were the secrets that, that he had in his life? And so I want to talk about just one small section of his life, uh, particularly with Nebuchadnezzar uh, and the, the statue of gold, because that's where God really spoke some things to him that, I mean, were unheard of in, in all of time, honestly. Uh, so we'll just give a little bit of background, starting in Daniel 2, verse 1. It says, now in the second year in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. The king gave orders to call in the magicians, conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in, you know, it does say tell him his dreams. It didn't say tell him the interpretation. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. And we know from that story, <clears throat> he's saying, you tell me the dream and then I want you to give me the interpretation. Because if I tell you the dream, you're going to make up some interpretation. And we know that we know that this obviously was a very important to Nebuchadnezzar. He realized that he didn't need anyone to tell him. Whatever happened in that dream, he knew this is a seriously profound, impactful, significant dream. And I cannot risk having these people give me their interpretation, which may or may not be it, you know. So he thought, aha, I got a plan. You're going to tell me the dream 
and then you're going to tell me the interpretation, which is unheard of. And these, you know, these, he brought in his elite people, the people that were supposed to be the smartest, the wisest, the magicians, the sorcerers, the conjurers, you know, whatever secret arts they have. He didn't care. He wanted to understand what this dream is. Um, they, of course, couldn't do it. So he orders, and, and it's funny, I read a lot in Daniel, just because you start reading this stuff, even to study and you can't quit, you know, you keep reading and reading. But it's like, I don't know how many times Nebuchadnezzar just said, kill them and d- d- turn their houses into rubble heaps, you know. You know, I mean, he, this guy was like, you know, executions for breakfast, executions for lunch, exe- this is how he lived, you know. It, you can see that. He was the, the Adolf Hitler of his time, times 10. I mean, he was not a, a good man to be around. I mean, he was either going to raise you up or you were going to be dead by breakfast. You know, that was just the way it was going to be. And if you didn't do miracles on a regular basis in front of him, you should fear for your life. And that was the case. These, you know, the people that he brought, they couldn't interpret, you know, or tell the dream, much less interpret it. So he did. He ordered all their execu- executions and he ordered all their houses be made into heaps of rubble. In other words, not only will you die, but your posterity will be homeless and fatherless. You know, you'll have, they'll have nothing. So it was a, a rough thing. So then they had uh, uh, the, the guy that uh, Nebuchadnezzar put in order, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, Arioch, that was his name. He was in charge of executing everyone and making their houses rubble heaps. So he's go out gathering all the, the sorcerers and conjurers and magicians and whatnot. And he gets to Daniel, and Daniel's like, you know, Daniel had already had some favor with him. Um, Daniel's like, what's up? What do you mean we're all dead? And he, oh, he explains, because Daniel had favor with this guy. And he explains, and he's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm in this group. Daniel was counted as among the magicians and sorcerers and conjurers. That's who was, you know, that was Daniel's group, you know, according to the king. And he's like, please give me a couple days, give me a little bit of time, and I'll seek the Lord, and, and I'll you know, see if the Lord will give me the interpretation. And he found favor with Arioch. And up until this point where this dream came, the only thing that we know about Daniel is that he was that youth, as I had described, taken out of uh, Israel. And in his training, he decided, I can't eat this. This is against, this is not biblical food. I can't eat this. You know, and it doesn't say what it is, but it was clearly against the word of God for him to eat this stuff. You know, whether it was sacrifice to idols, whether it was, you know, shrimp cocktail, we don't know. But he said, can I please just have vegetables and, and water and that's it. And this, I believe, was uh, Arioch as well. And he said, are you kidding? The king will kill me. So, he, you know, Nebs kills people just like that. You know, he doesn't think twice. If you don't do what I need you to do, I kill you. Uh, there's no consequences other than death for this king. So that's the only thing we know about Daniel. He said, please, just give me 10 days. And he said, okay, fine, I'll give you 10 days. And it says in the end of that 10 days, he looked healthier, stronger. He shined more. I mean, he just looked radiant compared to, he looked better than the other people, not just you passed the test. He looked better than everyone else. So that's the only thing we know of Daniel, the only thing. He was clearly adhering to the word of God, uh, and that was the only thing we know. So he found favor uh, with Arioch, and then the story continues. Daniel went to his house, informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And Daniel blessed the God of heaven, and Daniel said, and I think, you know, I included this part. I was going to cut it off there, but I think this is important. God gave him the revelation, but the story doesn't end. He blessed God. He praised God. He was thankful. He didn't just take that and say, oh, thanks, God, and go. I mean, he was serious in his thanks. Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon and he went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king's presence and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Daniel also could have said, hey, 
you can take care, you, go, you can finish them off, but I have the answer, you can save me and my three friends, you know. He was a compassionate man as well. He wanted all the lives spared, even though he knew they were tricksters, magicians, conjurers, sorcerers, the evil, seeking false gods. But he was a compassionate man. He said, you know, spare their lives as well. I have the answer that will save all their lives. So we can see that about Daniel. Uh, he was a man of compassion. Uh, then Arioch hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a, ma found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. And the king said to Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, named after one of the king's gods, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. We also see tremendous humility. He could have very easily said, yep, I got it. I'll go ahead and tell you that. He said, no one can do it, you know, himself included. I can't do that. But God can, and in fact, God has made known to you, and I'm going to tell you what God has shown you. So very much of a, uh, he was a humble man, without a doubt. Um, Daniel was very faithful with a little bit that he hadn't been given. Um, and it's very evident that Daniel worked very hard. You know, he was given three years, a time span. Nebuchadnezzar wanted him raised up. Those who passed the test would serve in the king's court. And in the end, uh, when it was time for all these people, you know, we don't know if it was a dozen or if it was hundreds, but of all the people that they had brought in and, you know, were given training and teaching and uh, access to libraries to learn the ways of Babylon, to learn the languages, to learn everything going on, it said that Daniel, uh, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael were 10 times, 10 times better than everyone else than all the magicians, and it wasn't just the, out of the people in there, the, the, better than anyone in, in all the land of Babylon. That includes all the existing sorcerers, conjurers, magicians, and wise men. I mean, how could these brand new people be wiser than people who have grown up in Babylon, you know, that are just the experts of this land? They're 10 times better. They way outshone. And of course, you know, scripture is clear that God gave them favor. But Daniel was faithful. What tiny little bit he had been given, here's my diet, I think I'm going to at least try to do this right. I mean, that's all that we know of. He was faithful to God in the little bit that he'd been given, and he clearly had to work hard. You know, I don't think God just poured it into his head in dreams at night. I think he studied, but clearly that didn't come from studying because he had access to the same books that everyone else did, and yet he was 10 times better. So God anointed what he did with his hands. So he was faithful with a little. And even, you know, that was even read into one of these little things. He gives wise to the wisdom, you know, or wisdom to the wise. He gives knowledge to those who are smart. And that's clearly a scriptural precedence. You know, he who has more will be given. He who does not have even what he has will be taken away. So that principle is in here. Um, work the little bit, whatever little bit we've been given, we've got to work that, you know. And uh, God will bless us abundantly. And of course, Daniel's whole life, this is just a snippet, but God continually gave him revelations, insight, knowledge, things that no one else ever knew. You know, the handwriting on the wall. He was brought in from out of retirement. You know, we know that story. I love that story to Cyrus. You know, Cyrus just becomes king. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the one that took all the gold cups, all the things out of the temple through four king reigns. Finally, Cyrus is like, hey, let's go grab that stuff. Where'd you get that? I don't even know. Let's, let's eat and drink out of the, you know. This was supposed to be holy unto the Lord. And that night, you know, Cyrus's life was required. A hand appears on the wall, starts writing. And uh, Cyrus, once again, who can tell me what this, I'll give you, make you second in command. I'll give you all kinds of stuff. No one can do it. And some woman remembers Daniel. And so they go get him out of retirement. He's an old man at this point. And he says, I'll give you, you know, this and that. And Daniel's like, nothing you give me matters because tonight your life is due for what you have done, you know, with all these, with these articles here. And sure enough, that night, they snuck under the water, came in, and they destroyed the city. Anyway, it's amazing. Daniel's whole life is that way. Uh, he's a good example of someone that we can look to, as someone who received the secret things of God. It's really amazing. Psalm 25, 14 says, The secret of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he will make them known his covenant Adonai relates intimately. Oh, I'm sorry. That was out of the NESB. Now the CJB, the, uh, I can't remember what CJB stands for. 
Sorry. Complete Jewish Bible. Yeah, yeah complete Jewish Bible. Yeah, Adonai relates intimately with those who fear him and makes them know his covenant. Uh, and then the NIV says the Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. And, and all of them talk about fear him. And we know this isn't that I'm scared to death of my father. You know, we know when it's to fear God, we know that it's an act of reverence. It's, it is recognizing, like Neb's, he can take us out in a heartbeat. If it was his will and desire, there's nothing going to stop that. But we aren't supposed to be scared of our heavenly father but we sure had better recognize who he is, that he is the king of all kings, the Lord of lords, the creator, maker of heaven and earth. All power, glory, and honor belong to him. So we reverence him. And I put the definitions of that word fear uh, from the olive tree, and then I put the pul pulpit commentary as well. But, <clears throat> uh, but to fear is truly is to revere, honor, respect, stand in awe, and to reverence him. Uh, and that's what we're, what we're to do. And it also is to be feared to cause astonishment and awe, be held in awe, inspire reverence or godly fear or awe. And that's certainly what we should have. Uh, so if we want to have the secrets of the Lord, we need to revere our God. And I love what the pulpit commentary says about this particular verse. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. God favors those who fear him with secret and confidential communion. Uh, and you find that in Proverbs 3.32. He comes unto them and makes his abode with them. John 14.23. And he teaches them. John 14.26. He enlightens them and leads them in his way and learns them. Uh, verse 5. And seals their instruction. Job 33.16. And he will show them his covenant. Uh, i.e. make them see the full force of it since his commandment is exceeding broad. Psalm 119.96. Um, God is God and we are not. A and I hope that we all have reverence. And I know sometimes it's, it seems like a difficult balance to walk. Scared of him. Uh, he's, you know, we see him as the judging God and other times we see him as our best friend and, and we can end up, you know, going in the direction of too casual and you know, we are his sons. He loves us. We are his children. But we never want to forget that we are to reverence uh, him as our father. You know, when we have kids, we don't let them treat us as just as our friends. They will still honor us as their parent, you know. And that's, we always have to, we can't cross that line because it's not good for the child. And it's not good for us in relationship with our heavenly father. He owes us nothing. He can't be overpowered, overcome, manipulated, controlled, um, he is sovereign, and he can't be outwitted. You know, we're not going to get these things out of him. He's, he's an amazing, amazing God. And when we pray, we've got to follow through. You know, we pray and say, Lord, you know, teach me, show me things, give me revelation. And I'll tell you what, like we learned last week, if we don't follow through on what we learn, on the things that he gives us to do, you know, we may or may not be hearing much in the future uh, because we're no longer, if we're not accountable with what we, learn, what we learn, why would he want to give us more if we're not even faithful with the little he gives us? And many times, you know, I hope we all realize this, many times that revelation, those secret things, they're commandments. You know, not just things that are written in the word, things that I expect you to do, things that I expect you to carry out. You will pick up that phone and you'll call this person and you'll humble yourself in front of this person or whatever it is, you know. We have to be faithful in carrying out whatever he lays in our hearts because if we're saying, Lord, give us, you know, talk to us, tell us the deeper things, we had better be faithful with every word that he gives to us, you know, or we shouldn't be expecting him to give more. He'll just be waiting for you to finish that last job that he gave you four years ago. And that's a bad place to be in, and I know I've been in that place, and I suspect most of us has. God shares his secrets with his friends. And I love the story. We all know that Abraham was, you know, the one in scripture written as the friend of God. <clears throat> and certainly God confided in him things that he was going to do as well. Genesis eighteen sixteen starts, The men rose up from there and looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed? For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. And the Lord said, The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin exceedingly grave. I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. 
Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And I love it. God never said, I'm going to sweep them away. He just said, I've heard something. I'm going to go down and see what's going on. Abraham knew immediately, you're going to destroy the city. If what you heard is true, you're going to... So he had an intimate relationship with God. You know, it was not revealed by those words that God spoke. That He, was, he didn't say, I'm going to go see what's going on. But Abraham knew. He knew God intimately enough to know, oh no, I know what this means. God, will you really destroy everyone? Abraham came near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. With, will you indeed sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? He begins, you know, we know the rest of the story. He begins to negotiate with God, getting it all the way down to 10. If there's 10 righteous, you know. But he knew uh, not only what God was doing, but he recognized, oh, Lord, can I speak? Can I share this? Lord, you wouldn't do that, correct? I mean, I know you. You you wouldn't judge everyone on the sake of, you know, if there's 50 righteous, you're not going to destroy them all at once. You know, and he negotiates down to the 10, which we know, you know, truly God only found one, Lot. Lot was the only righteous one. But he spared Lot's family for the sake of Lot. He spared his two daughters and his wife. And of course, his wife turns around, looks back, and she's destroyed on the way. Um, But Abraham knew God. He had an intimate relationship with him. And honestly, God thought, you know what, before I do this, I'm going to go check with Abraham. You know, this is what I'm thinking of doing. I'm going to go get his ideas, his thoughts about this before I do it. Because God could have gone and done that and said, oh, by the way, this is what we're going to do. This is what I've, I'm, I'm doing or this is what I've, I've done after the fact. But before he does it, he goes to his friend Abraham and says, hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing. What are your thoughts, Abe? You know, he had a relationship with him. It's just beautiful, you know. Um, and I think it's just so imperative that we build and form that relationship, you know, a relationship of friendship, of, of being sons and daughters and having an intimate relationship uh, with our father. Uh, it's beautiful. Another person that I see, and this kind of speaks to what Hayes was talking about, you know, about Dale and Menorah. I didn't know God would just respond that quickly. You know, you ask him and he answers, you ask and he answers. And we see this throughout the life of David over and over and over. And, um, you know, the things that God gave to David were many, many, many times life and death issues. I need to know what's going on now. What do you want me to do, God? I mean, I'm here, I'm your servant. What should I do? I'm scared, I'm this, or I'm not scared, but it's like, uh, what do I do? You know, this is a tough situation that I'm in, but David's a great person to look at as well, scripturally. So we'll read um, a few things about David that scripture just talks about because how God interacted with him was absolutely amazing. And also keep in mind, we know this. Anyone who's read the Psalms, David was a man who poured his heart out to God over and over and over. You know, he was not one of those, I'm going to put on a nice strong face for God. And, you know, he poured his heart out. When he was mad, he was mad. He, pour, he shared it. If he's mad at people, he shared that. You know, he was always reverent to God, but he never failed to share his heart, to share his, you know, the, the aches and pains, the depths of his soul. He wasn't Uh, too afraid to repent when he totally blew it either. When he realized he was confronted with grave sin, Bathsheba, man, he was on his knees in an instant, you know? He realized he totally blew it. But but David shared his heart with God over and over and over, and I believe that's one of the keys to having intimacy with God and having God share things is having that relationship, one of intimacy and not wearing a mask, of being clear, transparent with God. So 1 Samuel 23, 1 through 5 says, uh, then they told David saying, behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are plundering the threshing floors. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and deliver Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we're afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the ranks of the Philistines? We're already scared with no army against us. Now you want to go into the army? Uh, Then David inquired of the Lord once more, and the Lord answered to him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines, and he led away their livestock and struck them with great slaughter. Thus David delivered the inhabitants of Keilah. So he's like in a really, really bad place, and he needs an answer right now. He asks God, God answers immediately. Here's what you need to do. Real simple. And this is just moments later. I mean, it's just five verses after uh, the last one. 
Then David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard for certain that Saul is seeking to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. So David goes, he delivers Keilah, he rescues them all, he saves them. Saul hears about it and he's like, ah, I'm going to go, now I know where David is, I'm going to go kill him. Uh, so he's saying, will the men of Keilah surrender me? I mean, I just saved all their lives, I rescued them, I delivered them from the Philistines who were plundering them, destroying them. Will they now turn me over? And God's like, oh yeah, they will. Yeah. The Lord said, uh, yeah, he will come down. Will the men of Keilah surrender me and the men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, yeah, they'll surrender you. Then David his men, about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went wherever they could go. When it was told Saul that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up pursuit, and David stayed in the wilderness and the strongholds and remained in the hill country and wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver him into his hand. I mean, you would think... Surely they won't turn me over. I just spared, I mean, I just, I came, risked my life to rescue you, not for anything, but for your sakes. And God's like, yeah, they're going to turn you over just that quick, you know. How sad, but, uh, but God tells him, yeah, get out. Saul is coming, and they will turn you over. They're not going to hide you. They'll reveal you. So amazing. Could you imagine having been David and not having answers like this? And the truth is, every one of us are Davids. Every one of us have spiritual battles that we're fighting every single day of our lives. Um, how could we be fighting the battles that we fight without interaction from God? He already knows the answers. He knows everything. We need to be not only pursuing, but expecting God to say, yeah, this is what I want you to do. This is what you shouldn't do. Because um, he wants the best for us, you know? He does. First uh, Samuel 30, verse 8, David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said, pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. Isn't that awesome when you know that, hey, go do this, the victory is yours, I'm giving it to you. I mean, it's like, pff, you don't even feel like you need to do anything. It's like, I just got to show up and we're going to win. Second Samuel 2, 1, then it came about afterwards that David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go up to one of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. So David said, where shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So God, you know, he's telling him everywhere he needs to go. This is, this is what you need to do. I'm watching over you, David. This is why Saul's not going to get you because I'm telling you where to go. The enemy will not catch you, David. Second Samuel 5, 19, Then David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. Uh, Second Samuel 5, 22, Now the Philistines came up once again and spread themselves out in the valley of Rephaim. When David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go directly up. Circle around behind them and come at them in front of the balsam trees. I mean, talk about specific instructions. You know, David's saying, should I go? Yeah, and when you go, go this way, come up, go this way. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees. I don't know how you'd hear sound of marching, you know, marching in the tops of the balsam trees. Then you shall act promptly, for then the Lord will have gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. So he's saying, not only will all this happen when you hear this, I'm already going to be at war with them. I'm already going to be battling them. So David did so just as the Lord had commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. You know, I mean, this is why David was just so victorious. It wasn't because he was the greatest warrior, and I'm not diminishing that he was a good warrior. Of course he was. But the battles were always God's. You know, he didn't defeat Goliath because he was stronger than Goliath or mightier or whatever. It's because God was with him. He had the favor of God. And when he went to fight Goliath, you know, that big public enemy number one, it's because he had fought battles in private when it's just him, God, and the sheep, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. And he saw that God can deliver the lion from his hand, the bear. You know, bare hands. He's killing these animals. That's why when Saul said, Is anyone, can anyone fight this man? And David's like, man, I'll do this. He didn't say, I'll go up and fight against him and, and we'll see. He's like, I will destroy this man because he knew from his battles that he had won in private, I know my God and I know I can't fight bears and lions and kill them. But my God can, and he always delivers my enemy into my hands, and he always delivers your enemy into my hands. You task me with watching these sheep, I will watch them with my life. And I trust you, God, to deliver uh, all, all my enemies from my hand. He knew it. We need to have that same confidence in our God, and it's built through relationship, you know, knowing him. Because sometimes he's saying, yeah, flee. It isn't always, I'm always going to give them into your hands. Sometimes it's, yeah, run. You know, but I'm going to protect you. And when, you know, we need to know the difference between when it's time to run and when it's time to stand and fight. We got to know. I, I just can't imagine living life not having God at our, you know, at our side with us, 
saying, yes, for us, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, you know? We've got to have that. We've got to hear these things from the Lord. And this one, uh, these two, I think, come from, uh, no, this is, this is David again. 1 Kings 5, 4, but now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. And this is Solomon writing this. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. Behold, I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. And as the Lord spoke to David, my father, saying, your son, whom I will set in your throne, he will build the house for my name. You know, David wants to build the, the temple for God, but God says, nope, sorry, your son will do it though. But you know, God's speaking to David all the time. And this is interesting, this kind of adds an aside. It says, Solomon is saying, there is neither adversary nor misfortune. There's rest on every side. That word adversary is the word Satan. Solomon is saying, my father did such a great job. There is not Satan, does not exist in the land of Israel. There is no Satan here in Israel, period. He is gone. He has been destroyed and eliminated. So Solomon entered into a a true season of rest because of what his father had done. Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. I mean, if the word of God is true, the word of God is true. If we ask, we need to expect to receive. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It's uh, up to us to pursue. And it's not just ask once. It's ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. You know, it's like that story of the widow who keeps going to the judge. He's evil, but because of her persistence, he gives her what she's asking, you know. And God says, that's the way I want you to come to me. I mean, that's not... Our imagination, God gave the parable. God says, that's the way I want you to come to me. He's evil and he'll give. How much more will I give to you if you keep persistent in asking me? Proverbs 25, 2 says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search out a matter. And this is just so true of God in all of scripture. Um, David is, is a good example. David got so much glory, but was it ever David? No, it was always God. You know, God wants to give you guys glory, all of us. He wants to give us glory. He hides things so that if we pursue and get the answers, we'll go out and either present this, do that, do whatever, and everyone's gonna think, wow, look at Hayes did. I can't believe that Hayes. Go, Hayes! You know, and Hayes is like, it's not me, it's God, you know. But God wants Hayes to have glory. You know, God wants Bill to have glory. God wants all of us to have glory, so he hides things, he conceals things. And it's up to us to pursue that he wants us to have the victory. He wants to share that, you know? It's, it's amazing. He could take it all, and we know, we know it's all God, you know? And in the end, it is all God's, and we all know that. But God wants us to have that too. He wants to share in that. We have an awesome God, you know? Um, but he hides things we just need to pursue, and we search it out. And sometimes that's in Scripture, you know? studying, 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 and we'll get revelation. Sometimes it's in, on your face in prayer. You know, Bible said over here and it's just mano y mano with God and he'll reveal things to you, put things in your heart which are beautiful. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. And that's what I was saying earlier. Sometimes we get revelation it's for the purpose of doing, not just hearing and going, wow, I got some great knowledge. Ha ha, I, I know something. No, you better do that something that you know. Proverbs 3.32, for the devious are an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. We've got to walk out righteousness and holiness. That's who he's intimate with, and he's not going to share with people he's not intimate with on a, reg on a general basis. Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals a secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So God reveals things. He says, I'm not going to do things unless I reveal what I'm doing first. It's amazing. He wants to. But will we listen? Matthew 13, 10. And the disciples came, to, came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Yeshua answered and said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but it has not been granted. But to them it has not been granted. And I just, I love this. It's so interesting because they're saying, what do you mean it's been given to us? We're here asking you because we also don't understand. Like them, we also don't <laughs> understand these variables. But anyway, for whoever has, more shall be given. And 
he will have an abundance, but whoever does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In the case, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart in return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. The solution isn't always in, in reading the scripture and going, you know, I understand everything. We can't have the expectation that because you hear it the first time or it's read to you or whatever that we get understanding. The secret is in going in the prayer closet afterwards saying, Lord, I just read your word or I just heard what you said. I just had this dream. I just got a vision. Someone just gave me a word. I don't get it. I know I'm supposed to get it, but I don't. It's revealed in the, in the secret place and that's where we need to go and that's what they did. You know, it says they brought him aside afterwards and said, Lord, I don't understand these parables. What does it mean? You know, and why do you, why do you speak to everyone in parables? Well, the majority never came to him afterwards and said, what does that mean? They just didn't understand and went, huh, that's weird, and walked away. He wants those who are passionate for him, who will seek him out in the prayer closet and say, man, I know you got the words of life, but I don't get it. I don't understand what you're saying. Please reveal to me the secrets that are contained in your words because I don't get it. He wants people who are going to pursue him and pursue his words knowing that he carries life in those words. Mark 4.10 says, As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. He was saying to them, To you it's been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may not hear and understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. So they never came in, they never went to the there's a private place with the Lord and asked, but his disciples did. John fifteen twelve says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. We're called to be uh, his friends and that is manifest because we do what he says. You know, if he's telling us to do things and we're not doing it, we're kind of hard pressed to say that we're the friends of God. You know, look at Abraham. Talk about the model of obedience. I mean, goodness gracious, sacrifice your son. Hey, pack up everything and go. Where am I going? I don't know. He just said go. We're going. We've got to walk out obedience. You know, we know in our own lives, we don't reveal secrets, deep things to people we don't know, to strangers on the street, but to friends we will, particularly those that we're intimate with, particularly those that we have a deep, strong relationship with. Those are the people that we share the deep things in our hearts. How much more the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, Just as, as it is written, things which eye has not seen nor ear heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. And of course, this is a, a quote from Isaiah 64.4 and 65.17. <clears throat> for to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which are what? Everything. He says all things are being revealed. And it comes through relationship with the Holy Spirit and we know that's through Yeshua I will not leave you as orphans Yeshua said I will come to you and of course he's not here in the physical he's here in the spirit so his revelation comes through his Holy Spirit um, and we have just got to have that relationship you know that's and I know we talk about that a lot a lot a lot but I say it because it's just so important you know we can't hear it enough that we have got to pursue intimacy with a relationship with God um Set your alarms a little earlier than whatever it is that you're doing. Get up earlier. Take more time. Go to bed earlier. 
or take time before you go to sleep and, and sit with him, you know, take time throughout the day, block it aside, because I, you know, we all know this, if you're just waiting for time for the Lord to come, I promise you it won't come, in fact, it'll all be filled up every single bit, and, and, and the enemy will be sure to fill your time, but you have to take it and set aside, and then expect the adversary to try to block something in, to have a call, to get this, to get that, to take that time away, and we have to have the resolve and recognition that's just the enemy coming against me. I will not let anything interfere with my time with the Lord. And you hold true to that. And I'm not saying that emergencies don't truly come, you know. You know, like Nathan gave his testimony, when when you get a call like that, you drop everything that you're doing, you know. You, you minister to people and you love one another. Um, but 99% of the stuff that comes up in our lives that we justify, oh, I couldn't spend time with the Lord because of this or that, it's garbage. It's urgent, unimportant garbage, you know, that we've got to learn to discern, to weed out of our lives uh, and find ourselves intimate with him. And we will hear those things. We will hear the deep secret of God. And how do you think we get revelation for a successful life, you know? And I don't mean successful for us. I mean successful for him, for building the kingdom of God, for being a great and mighty warrior, for being someone that has accomplished much, that's left a legacy for God. You know, when God looks at you, it's like, here's crown, 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 crown. Not for us, but we can then lay him at his feet and say, thank you, I give this gift to you because it was yours in the first place. I never earned it. You enabled me. You know, you gave me the power to work. You gave me the power to serve. You gave me the wisdom and the insight, and that's what we're after. And it will only be found in intimacy with our God and King. Amen.